Hi. All right, guys. We are, we are back with another comic creator chat. It's always fun getting to do these interviews from over with guys who are across the ocean from us because we gotta get our time schedules right. So that's why it's a lunchtime interview for me, and it's after dinner interview for you. Yeah, right, John? time interview for me. <laughs> so this is John Lee's uh, guys. Once again, this is CBSI, and I'm gonna throw our little intro video up there just to remind you who we are. And. All right, sorry. I like to throw that out there. D doing this live thing, I'm slowly getting used to it. A lot of times I tape, <laughs> but live I found out is a lot more interesting for people just because they have a chance, if they do get a chance to catch us. Now, it's lunchtime over here in the United States. It's nighttime for you. But, uh, John, I'm so thankful that you agreed to do an interview with me. No, thanks for having me on. Like I said, I really enjoy the live broadcast as well. I always think it's great interacting with people in the moment and seeing like, you know, the live reactions and stuff. And there's a different energy to it as well. So it's definitely a lot of fun doing it this way too. Yeah, it's um, yeah. I, 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 the more I've done it, I'm like, okay, I like this a lot better. I, I don't have a giant audience. A lot of mine actually end up watching it later on as they find Well, that's time. the good thing. They can always watch it later as well. So like, oh, it's yeah. not either or. So... I, it was so sort of interesting. We set up the interview. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. So I've been reading Hotel, loved it. Um, even like debated, like, do I want to try to do an exclusive cover for it? And I was like, well, I can't jump in volume two. That's just too weird to have, to have an exclusive for volume two. But so you've been doing AWA's Hotel. And then as, as soon as you said yes to the interview, I was like, well, what the hell? You're doing a freaking another comic that comes out the next week in yeah, Crimson um Cage. Yeah, exactly. The week, the two weeks, um, two comics. It's like I said, John Lee's comics are like buses. You wait ages for one, and two come along at once. I was, <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm titling this video. I'm titling my article that I'm about to write about you, Master of Horror, new Master of Horror, because everything I've read by you is dark, demented, and just, just some, one of those things. You're like. I can't do too much at one time because, man, that's that's harsh, but it's good. So I have to come back to it the next day, It's uh, <laughs> which is probably better than just a binge read. But I get, how did you get started? I, I mean, I got a little bit of your bibliography. You have a WordPress website out there that I don't think you've updated lately. But... Oh, yeah, no. I think it's been about a year <laughs> since I last visited WordPress. I, mean, I need to go back and update with, like, the Crimson Cage, like, a couple of my latest credits. Um, but, but, yeah, in terms of, like, um, how I got started and everything, like um, – my first comic was a book called The Standard um, back about a little over a decade ago. That was a superhero comic. Um, so even that had some kind of horror elements in it, but um, it was very much like my love with superheroes and that type of story. Um, and I kind of, the, the way I got started on that was it was an artist friend of mine who wanted to do a comic and he asked me if I wanted to write it. And I'd always had ambitions of writing and I'd always been a comic fan, but I'd never really put the two together. Like I was asked him I would like write novels or like I'd I just graduated from university and I like had like I was doing like a short film which fell through. Um so I'd never really thought about doing comics, but once I started exploring like the medium of comics and the limitations and the kind of structure of it, I thought it was quite fascinating. And then this, this the first comic script I ever wrote was the standard issue one. And it ended up that my artist friend never drew it. Uh, it didn't match their style, but um, that script kind of like sat there like in the on file for a little while until um, Stephen Forbes, who's an editor ran an online column called The Proven Grounds where he would like review people's scripts and give them feedback. So I thought, what the heck, I'll submit um, issue one of the standard. And they really liked it. And, you know, he said, like, oh, this is really good. I could actually get this made. And so then, like, he ended up being my editor for the project. He kind of, like, held my hand through the process of, like, learning how to make a comic. And that came out through Comics Tribe. And Comics Tribe are people who I've been working with to some degree ever since. Um... My kind of big move into horror came a little while later when I did uh, a comic called And Then Emily Was Gone, which came out in 2014. Um, and that, well, there we go, we see it there. And Emily Was Gone was probably the first book that people really noticed. Like, I did uh, The Standard, and that went really below the radar, mostly outside of, like, the Glasgow, Scotland independent scene. But And Then Emily Was Gone, which is weirdly a more Scottish book. It's like, um, I've been saying it's like Twin Peaks set in the Orkneys, um, or the Orkney Islands. It's like, it's about 
um, this kind of like cop who sees that these horrific visions of monsters that form around wherever he goes and he meets this girl who asks him to help her find her missing best friend and her search takes him up to this island community called Mercy where strange and terrifying things happen and like that was me like really just like going because like, I've always loved horror um like going back to like I was a little kid and I was like watching films I probably shouldn't have been watching but um, I, I for some reason like when I, like, I never really clicked to do horror comics. I think it was like when I'd read like uh, Uzumaki by Junji Ito, like something like 2009, 2010. I was like, oh my god, people actually can do horror comics. So I thought I want to do something that's really scary and out there. And Ian Laurie is a fantastic artist. And, like I've said that an enemy was gone is pretty much like Ian Laurie fanfic. <laughs> like you know, I was writing stuff that I knew he'd be great at drawing, so it's all kind of like horrific, kind of contorted monsters, and, like close ups of like sweaty faces with bulging eyes and you know, like you know, like sweaty foreheads and like madness. And um yeah, it was a lot of fun to kind of work on that genre and kind of do something that people still talk about today. That book, you know, for, was first released in twenty fourteen, was collected in twenty fifteen and we thought it would just be a little book. Like, when we originally, we originally came up with this idea, me and Ian, um, like, it was a work for hire gig we were going to do. It had fallen through, and we thought, let's just do something for us that we'd enjoy, that nobody, maybe even if nobody else likes it, we'll like it. And um, ended up being like people really responded to it. It became our first kind of like breakout hit that kind of like turned some heads. And people still to this day, like six, you know, like seven years after like, we first published it, people still will come up and talk about an Emily was gone. And, like, I've had some people, which is like, one of the biggest compliments I've ever had, is I've had some people come up to me at shows and say, like, I started making comics because, like, I picked up an Emily was gone, like, you know, at a local comic shop, you know, and I saw like the people in Scotland were doing books like this, you know, and it made me think, you know, I could do it as well. And that's like the biggest compliment you can have for a book. So that's a comic that means a lot to me. Um, but yeah, I did a couple of other projects here. There after an Emily was gone, I think you know I did Oxymoron for Comics Tribe. I did a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic um, for ITW, a kind of one shot with Nick Patara. Um, and then the next big breakthrough book I did was Sync uh, in 2017, um, which is again with the Scottish connection. Um, I worked with Alex Cormack on Oxymoron: The Loveliest Nightmare, which is a uh, um, kind of like it's a comics tribe property oxymoron's a character that's owned by tyler james like he's a villain in tyler's series the red 10 and we were doing a kind of like spin-off book i'm working a commission to write it we had a lot of fun on it and it was like you know really enjoyable to work on and we had a lot of creative freedom we were working on it but we did recognize ultimately like you know we were playing with tyler's toys and tyler's sandbox and we wanted to kind of make our own toys and do something with bears so we had a lot of conversations between us me and alex and we thought this thing sink um, which is a kind of twisted crime horror pulp saga <laughs> set in Glasgow um, in Sink Hill, which is this kind of terrifying, nightmarish, forgotten district to Glasgow um, that has like van dwelling murder clowns, a fox mask, shovel wielding vigilante, a cult gangsters, and all kinds of other terrifying things. Um, and yeah, so basically, it's like this book's kind of like my version, my kind of love letter to like John Carpenter and the Coen Brothers and a whole other melting pot of other influences, and even comics like Scalp, like you know, like crime comics really driven by location. Um, I wanted like a Glasgow version, like a love letter to Glasgow. Um, and yeah, that's probably been my, my that's probably the book now that even now that I'm best known for. Um, we've we've released two volumes, ten issues of it. Volume three is coming out next year. We've got mm. a we're currently we've got Dig, which is a kind of graphic novel one shot, which bridges the gap, kind of on Kickstarter. And yes, I know we've been eagerly asking about that every time I go to shows. Folk are saying when's it coming back? So it's coming back soon. And yeah, like, you know, I know I've been talking a long time now, so I don't want to be like, you know, over right now, but mm-hmm. yeah, like, after we did Sync, like, we did, like, last couple of years, we did Mountainhead with ITW, which was a really fun book with Ryan Lee. And, and, and you're jumping lot. so fast here. I want to hit you, I'm going to talk about Sync for a minute, and we'll get oh, yeah, 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 I was, I was thinking we'd do the kind of, like, the whistle stop tour, then go back mm-hmm. and talk about individual books. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the Sync, this is one of those books, uh, and, and also Comic Strive, I'm curious about, before we get to AWA, which I love AWA stuff, and that's why we're talking, but yeah. I picked up this one here on the right, the bus, the second print of Sync Number One. Yeah, at a, just randomly at a comic shop because it just scared me. Um, the clowns in the van, and then I read through the first store, the first five issues or whatever, and 
it's just I guess we call and that's why I'm calling you like the master of horror because each individual issue can be read individually and be a yeah. complete story. But there's connective tissue throughout the entire thing that like the van you see in one issue pops up in the next issue or the clowns or and you get little pieces. And I, I love that. And I'm assuming it's one of those like you have those things in your head of, hey, I want to do this. But if I don't get to issue four, or if I don't get to issue seven, I want to be sure that it's done. And yeah. um, what is Comic Stripes? Because you're definitely a part of it. Oxymoron was a part of it. And the, the one that everyone knows, uh, the other one was Wailing Blade. Like, what is Comic Stripe a unique to Glasgow sort of area, or is it? No, Comic Stripe's worldwide. They're actually like principally based in the US. Tyler James, the publisher, is based out of Massachusetts. Um, and yeah, so basically, like they started out like you know, you know the East Coast of the US, and um, I, I basically got to know them through Stephen Forbes, my editor in the Standard, um, who was also working as an editor. For Comic Stripe back when we were first launching. The Comic Stripe originally started off, their premise was their headline was creators helping creators make better comics. And they were like a tutorial website where like you know, they'd run columns with like guides for creators. Like Stephen Forbes had like this you know proving grounds column where they reviewed scripts and they had Bolts and Nuts, which was like a kind of guide to making comics. And then Tyler James did a kind of like column series about the business of comics and things like that. And I did uh weekly column called The Creator Own Zone where I would review, review you know, indie comics that people would submit and like that was kind of like the kind of starting point of comics tried then from there we thought well, we'll put our money where our mouth is we're going to start making our own books as well yeah. and we ended up like we had an opening lineup of books the standard was one of them and then we also had the red pen from Tyler we had I think um, Runners from Stephen and we had a couple of other books that were peppered in there like Scam by Joe Mulvey um, and we so we had this kind of like launched lineup of books and it was very much small scale at first and then we got the diamond distribution deal and we started kind of like shipping through diamond and like as i say it was very small at first like the standard didn't make too much of a splash but and then we was gone ended up being like our biggest book at the time and that came out but then since then we've had other big hits uh, like Whale and Blade recently was a big hit for them and like actually their biggest hit is like Seas for Cthulhu which is like a children's book um, hmm. that they publish um, so yeah no they're kind of like a worldwide enterprise like you know they've published like a, a roster of talented creators um, both in and out of Scotland <laughs> um, but yeah no so yeah no, no, like I say and they've got some really cool stuff coming up as well like not just from me like I say um, they've got a book called Happy Hill which I believe is launching um, in the direct market soon but they definitely had a Kickstarter campaign recently because that's generally because like Tyler James like his main job is he runs Comics Launch, which is a kind of like a crowdfunding tutorial series, like, you know, like, you know, teach people how to crowdfund comics and runs like a mm. podcast and stuff. So Kickstarter is a big part of Comics Tribe's model. They tend to, what they do is, is they'll do like a Kickstarter ahead of like a book's launch, like, you know, ahead of the first issue, they release like a special edition, you know, like, you know, like first oh, yeah. issue book that will like go out to backers and that will kind of like act as the kind of initial like hill of momentum. And then, like, the series will launch in the direct market. Then they'll come back and do a Kickstarter for the collection. That tends to be, like, you know, the model they go for. Um, okay. So, yeah, but, like, they've got a book called Happy Hill coming out. And after that, next year, they've got um, Volume 3 of Sync coming out. Yeah. Okay, that, and that, that helps me because I've interacted with lots of – I've interacted with guys who are source point guys. And source yeah. point has the same model, too. And then yeah. guys from Scout, they do it a little bit differently, but – like a lot of you the, that have jumped into smaller labels or start, yeah. got your start on smaller yeah. labels. I mean, one of the cool things is, because I've been doing like yearly shows going back to like, you know, like, was, like before the pandemic happened, I was going to New York like every year going back mm. to like 2011. And I remember it was like, you know, like, when we started, when Comic Stripe started out, we were in like Artist Alley or the small press section. And you see other people who are in the small press like Scout or like, you know, Source Point or, you know, Black Mask or like Vault or whatever. And then they would progress into becoming like a publisher and going in the proper publisher section, the main table. So we've all kind of grown up around the same time, which has been quite yeah. cozy. That And that's, it's just, and for me, like the pandemic opened up the world for us to podcast and talk to you guys. Because our alleys and the uh, small publisher and all those alleys are great, but you get overwhelmed when you walk through CTE to your New York Comic Con. or It's like, okay, who yeah. do I want to see? Okay, and I get how long to talk to you and the and those types of things. Uh, so and that's this really cool. And doesn't travel well, like in a busy loud show for <laughs> yeah 
Um, so you you mentioned it and you did uh you jumped on and you did Mountain Head of IDW. How did you go yeah. from the, is that did you pitch it to them or did they come to you for Mountain Head? Um, well, we pitched it to them, but thankfully I had an end it with IDW because um. I did that aforementioned Turtles comic with ITW with the editor Bobby Kernel. So we had a kind of established relationship there. And um, so, like, me and Ryan Lee have been developing Mountainhead for some time. We've been shopping around a little bit. And the opening came up, like, to pitch to ITW. And we put a pitch together. And, like, I'll confess, like, I didn't choose, like, the best pitch pages at first. Like, the pages we chose were a bit kind of, like, quiet and dialogue driven. And, like, you know, the editor was like, you know, we like this idea, but we're not sure if, like, you know, the pages that you've got are really hammered on at home. Could you, like, do some work up some more pages for us? Like, can give, and that's something I'm infinitely grateful for because so many editors would have just been like, no, it's not grabbed us right away, so we're just going to pass. But the fact that they gave us that other opportunity, like, you know, they believed in the idea enough, and sure enough, like, we put, we put together another sequence, and this time, like, they were won over. And yes, we worked with ITW on uh, Mountainhead, which was like a lot of fun. And like ITW is obviously like a bigger company with an infrastructure behind it. Like, you know, Comics Tribe, like, you know, like I love that whole team, you know, but like it's very much like a one man show in a lot of ways. Like, you know, it's very like something like small and like, you know, grassroots. And, like, ITW has like a whole like staff and a legal team and a film department and, you know, all these meetings with other people, with other people you're having. I was like, well, this is like a big, you know, organization. Um, and yeah, like and they were super supportive with Mountainhead, and like yeah, it was a lot of fun working on it and working with Ryan. I, I still want to work on something else with Ryan. We've had some conversations and developed a couple of ideas, and um, hopefully we can do something else in the future because Mountainhead was a really fun project to work on. And we were mentioning before about Sync when you said that's all like you know one shots and it's like an anthology style. That has its benefits um, in terms of like accessibility, like an idea that you can just walk into a comic shop, pick up any issue. And like, you know, and I like the kind of format, but Mountainhead was very much a different pace. That's like one story that kind of like takes place over five issues. And it was nice to flex those muscles again, working on this series. Yeah. Well, and it's, I don't know, IDW is is one of those interesting publishers to me because they're more, in my head, they're more well known for doing all the Transformers, G.I. Joe. license stuff, yeah. All their license stuff, which they're, yeah. I think they're actually losing here if, in the future. But, and then you got, like, they have, like, Mountainhead. They had a sea of, like, they have a horror section that, like, it's yeah. sporadic throughout the year, but it's like, here's a little five, I think the, the one they have currently is Sea of Sorrows or Sea of something. It's like a mermaid horror story. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the fun story about that. I mean, you mentioned Sea of Sorrows. Um, obviously, me and Alex Cormack had worked on Sync together. And we were, you know, having a blast doing that. Then at the same time, pretty much, I think they were a little bit ahead, but at the same time, Alex got an IDW book, Road of Bones, with Rich Dwick, and I got an IDW book, Mountain and Riley's. So we both kind of graduated over at IDW at the same time in different books. Very nice. And then, but I, I got to find out, how did you go from into AWA? Because AWA, they brought, almost everyone was like an Axel buddy. Like Axel Alonso was someone that like he had worked with at Marvel or he worked with at Vertigo and you haven't been in the game long enough. Like when you came into the game was when he was leaving Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, like, you know, it's funny. Like I sometimes wonder like, what the hell am I doing here as well? But like, um, the story about that was, um, this was maybe go, this was going back to like 2018. Um, I was, I was working on Sync. Sync Volume 1 had came out at the time, and I think Sync Volume 2 might have just been launching or just getting ready to launch. And I got an email. I'm sorry, it was an email. It was like on Twitter, I got a notification that I said, Axel Alonso has followed you on Twitter. And I thought, <laughs> someone's pretending to be Axel Alonso and they followed me on Twitter. But no, it was the actual verified Axel Alonso account. So like, I followed him back and he sent me like a DM, like, you know, hey, I really loved Sync. I picked it up at my local comic shop and I thought it was excellent. I was like, oh, thank you. And he's like, you know, I'd love to talk to you about like, me working, on, working together on something in the future. And this was before AWA had even been announced or anything. So I was like, yeah. Sure, like that'd be great. I said, I'm, I'm going to New York Comic Con next week, but when I get back home, we can maybe arrange like a Skype call. And it's like, oh no, I'm based in New York, so if you want, we can just go for lunch. Um, so I ended up being like that too. The Tuesday before New York Comic Con, I had like my most important meeting, like before the convention even started, you know. <laughs> I'm like, so I ended up going like to some little Italian restaurant with Axel. Um, and like I say, like, 
it was, of course, it was like a roasting day, like, you know, so I'd been walking around and I was sweating like a pig, and I was like, I better go get like, changed, so it doesn't look like I'm just, like, sweating out in the air. <laughs> so, I mean, I, so, I said, I got quite changes for a minute, and, like, so we went, like, for lunch, and he said again, like, I loved Sync, I thought it was a really great idea, and then he started saying that, at the time, I'm not sure if he even said EWE at the time, he said that um, I've been brought on as editor for a new publishing imprint that's going to be launching soon, and we're trying to bring in some talent, a mix of like familiar names and like future big stars. Like, you know, and I think you'd be a great fit for it. <clears throat> and this was like the a real different experience for me because he said, like, first he said, I want you to send me like everything that you've got that you're currently pitching around. I want to see it. And also, I want you to develop some ideas like for us. Like, we're looking for ideas where we want to publish it. And this was such a massive like sea change for me because um, I'm used to like, for me, Pitching is like, I, ha- I come up with an idea and then I'm trying to kind of desperately make publishers pay attention. I'm trying to go like, mm-hmm. look at my book. And this was the first time where I had a publisher saying, we want to work with you, pitch something for us. So I was like pitching like to spec pretty much. Because I've always said that like, I've ta- I would, forgive me if you've heard this before, I use this an- analogy all the time, but like making a comic or creating a comic is like having a baby. It's like, you know, you're... You know, taking part of yourself and putting it into something new, you love it, you would do anything for it, like you're so proud of it. Pitching a comic is like taking that baby and putting him in a hamster wheel and rolling him down the motorway and hoping that he gets to the other side intact. <laughs> like, like, you know, suddenly, like, you know, you're the army of those people who don't care about your baby, they don't care about it, you know. And, like, and it can be really demoralising, like, you know, when you get the blunt rejections or just no reply at all. It's a really stressful process, and it's long been something I've associated as being not fun. Um, but... Things started to change. Or well, Mountainhead was the first time I think I actually had managed to actually pitch a book to a publisher, yeah. that, you know, with people who who weren't already my friends, and like you know, and be like you know them say yes. Um, but with um, AWA, this was the next step where they were like, you know, we want to work with you, develop ideas for us. And so, based on the conversation I had at that first dinner with Alex, I got or not Alex Axel, I got a few um, sort of things in my head. One. He said he wanted to do another anthology horror. He said that he loved um, Sync and he loved the anthology format. Two, uh, he said he, he brought up the setting of an old roadside motel as something he'd love to see. And although he was thinking about it in terms of like a noir or a crime story, but my mind instantly went to like horror for that setting. Yeah. And the third thing he said is I'd love if you could come up with something with clowns in it again because I love the clowns in Sync. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking the, the last. I'm not sure if I can swear, but the last effing thing that I want to like, you know, do is like another, you know, effing clown story. But you know, but um, I ended up thinking like, well, that's an interesting challenge. How can I do a clown story that's different from like the other clown story? So the clowns and sink are these kind of like grubby, horrific kind of like they live in a van. Or these like kind of you know spaced out, mad like you know fiends that kind of grab people. You know, I thought, why not go to a totally different tradition of clowns and have like you know the Commedia dell'arte, like Italian Renaissance, you know, theater and that kind of like clown archetype. And so I used that Piero, and that became Piero Courts. And then like the idea I could end up coming up with was I started thinking about um, like hotels can be scary places. Like I, I love that setting of a hotel as well, but for me, I think of like how creepy hotels can be, and. I, told, I think this story's in, like, the first issue and the little creator letter we put in, but I remember I was, I was staying at a hotel in New York, and I was in the bathroom getting ready, and I looked um, out of the bathroom, you know, into, like, the living room area, or kind of, like, the main area, like, you know, where the bed is and everything, and I saw a mirror, and in the mirror was reflected the bed, and the bed was one of those beds where it's, like, it was, like, high up, and it was, like, four posts, you could see underneath the bed, and I just had this idle thought of, wouldn't it be creepy if you looked in that mirror, and you saw, like, someone underneath the bed looking back at you, and, like, you know, and then, like, you know, and then that, then that kind of thought kind of blossomed and evolved and became, like, what was chapter three of um, Hotel Volume 1, but I started thinking about just, like, different ways that hotels can be creepy, how you're all these different stories, it's a great kind of setting for a anthology-type horror, I was, like, you know, because, like, there's different stories you could tell in that setting, and and so then, and then I started thinking about the iconography of like the Bates Motel, like you know, or Cycle, you know, like that idea of like, the, the modern, like you know, hotel with the kind of woman haunt, you know, house in the background, kind of like gothic and everyday kind of clashing. So that was my kind of like inspiration. I wanted to make it a kind of blend of like a classic haunted house story 
but with like you know modern Americana, you know, like, you know, like Route sixty six, like roadside hotels, that whole culture. So that became like a kind of blend. And then like originally when I put, I put together a pitch package for AWA, and originally the title was Next Exit No Vacancy. That was what it was going to be called. And um, it was like, and I pitched like kind of the four stories and the idea of like each, you know, taking place over a single day and like each chapter would be a different room and you were seeing the perspective of like a different room. Um, as with these terrific events unfold. And but they also work as standalone stories. And um then like Axel like loved it. He said it was great, but his his idea, um his you know, contribution was I think we should call it hotel. And he says and he says, Imagine um the logos like this like red neon sign and it says hotel and uh the O and the T are blacked out and there's an extra L scrawled on at the L. So that was all Axel. He came up with that idea of like hotel with two L's. And like I was like, oh here's a here's a genius at work this if you get all those editor bucks. <laughs> and like, you know, and yeah, so then the rest is history. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know, Hotel is a kind of horror anthology series set in a ro- like set in Piero Courts, which is this old roadside hotel off Route 66. Officially it doesn't exist. You won't find it on any map. But if you're travelling alone and you're truly desperate for sanctuary or secrecy, perhaps you'll see a sign on the edge of the road saying next exit. <laughs> and if you go there, um, you might end up wishing that you'd get put on driving. So that's the kind of elevator pitch that we have for hotel. And yeah, like, so I wrote that and I had a lot of fun. But like you were saying earlier on about how it was all Axel's friends and his like, former contacts and the big two, I very keenly feel that. Because I wrote the scripts in isolation. This was, like, say, this was my first ever like experience of getting a pitch picked up just based on my script no because usually i have to like pay for an artist and like you know mm-hmm. and get like you know i put a pitch package together with the whole creative team and sell them but no i was just based on like my my pitch document like yeah we'll take it so they put together the creative team so i wrote all the scripts before i even knew who was drawing it i wrote at least most of the scripts before i knew who was drawing it and then like i find out that i'm working with like dalabar tala each of like you know Punisher kills the Marvel Universe. <laughs> it was yeah. a non Punisher, so Deadpool <laughs> kills the Marvel Universe and like um various other big Marvel titles and um and it's like Lee Lowridge is in colours and Sal Cipriano is in letters. They're all like people with like Marvel DC credits. I was like the who who the hell is this guy in that team? And so yeah, so I felt a bit of pressure, but like I was proud of the book and I thought well, you know, like I was happy with how it turned out. But I don't think any of us really anticipated just how much people would love this book. People really responded to it. Um, like the response on social media with reviews. Like I think it's maybe because, like you were mentioning about how like the pandemic opened up this whole new world. People forget the AWA's big massive launch event. It was four titles that was going to be were launched in the same week. It was Hotel, The Resistance, Archangel A, and Red Border. They were all going to launch the same week, and AWA that organised like you know transatlantic signing events like you know the signings in the uk mm-hmm. signings in the us it was gonna be this massive big like awa day that was the day that, did that everything shut down because of the pandemic you know, oh, so, yeah. like so it ended up being we never got our big launch but with the with the kind of like group with the growing like with the rise of all these like youtube channels and like new podcasts have emerged as folk were kind of like stuck at home with their comics you know um I think people really started to kind of really discovered hotel um, and really kind of took to it. I think it really resonated with a lot of people, and like that really means a lot. The folk enjoyed it as much as they did, and all the kind messages and all the folks saying like, "Are we getting a volume two And tagging me and tagging AWA. I think it's thanks to all those messages and that avid response that we're sitting here talking now about volume two. I was looking for one of these. Not, oh I yeah, been... shot now. There's a blast yeah. in the past. These were these were genius. Uh, I was. Amazingly, I've you're the last person I need for the like the entire set of hotel interviews. I've interviewed oh, yeah. <laughs> back shoot right after the pandemic hit or whatever. I Axel agreed to interview like when I started doing this, he was like my third interview. I was like, and I didn't know who Axel was. I hate to admit, like I was just reaching out to AWA. I was like, <laughs> hey, new upstart company. I'll, I'll just reach out, and then Axel said yes. I was like, wait a minute, Axel. Lo- I wait, I know that name. <laughs> um, so he agreed to interview us, and at the time we had a format where the the creator would ch- or the the guest would choose a topic and we talk about our favorite books and then we talk about whatever they want to talk about but so like Axel chose crime and he talked about like what it was like to edit Mac uh, do the Max series for Marvel and then leading into doing the Upshot now and everything his plan and the resistance and the story and it just blew my mind his excitement and 
knowing what hotel is and sitting down and reading it, I'm like, no wonder Axel loved what you wrote because he loves, he turned, he brought Marvel into the world versus this crazy world that, that Marvel was. He's like, no, we're going to go into the dirt. We're going to go into the, and he had Garth Ennis writing stuff and he had all these amazing stuff that was being written. Yeah, and if you now, forget he, how many things he's done, like I remember like even things like uh, the Jim Echo Szynski, John Romita Jr. Amazing Spider-Man run, which is one of my all-time favorite comics. Yeah. Like he edited that as well, you know? Yeah, it's it's just amazing. And then I've re- we interviewed Lee Lowridge. So I, I interviewed your colorist. <laughs> <laughs> and he was amazing and uh, like it was awesome talking to him and just hit the way he the way he colors is amazing. He's one of my he's one of the five colorists I actually recognize the name when I read a comic. So yeah. the fact that he was on my list and he said, yes, I'm like, yes. And then I got Kieran Grant who did all th- the last three of your covers and the new yeah, ones. And, so I was like, like, and, I, and who's on board for all of our volume two covers. Oh, wow. Well, it's yeah. I was the second that your last cover came out, the pro uh, cover. Yeah. I was like, Oh God, that's freaking I mean, scary. Like, here's the cover for like the first issue of volume two. How good is Ooh, that? Yeah. And then you did, I loved, Hotel, uh, and to and I'm not a horror guy. I'm not. I don't read Walking Dead. That's just not my style um, of what I prefer. Not, not that I'm a diehard superhero, but I'm not a I'm not a horror guy necessarily. But I love the way your format works, and I've I've become a horror guy because of books like yours. I think it's amazing. You guys, you're doing Hotel. Then uh, I think his name is Mike Malcolm Prince. He's doing um, Ice Cream Man. Yeah, Ice Cream Man, yeah. And then Ha Ha's is like the Calhoun version of Ice Cream Man. But like slowly labels are starting to go, okay, we're going to do horror is becoming back in. People like to be scared and they don't necessarily, especially if you're not going to the movies to be scared, your books aren't gross and disturbing. They're scary. And I don't know, like, I mean, when I'm looking at the these four, I mean, just the ideas that you had behind these four yeah. books, I was just like, Oh, okay. Four, four different stories. But if you read them all together, each one of them has you walk out and she walks out of the room, and then the next story starts. And it's like how they all flow together. I loved all of it, and you really don't get to meet your clown to the very end. Like, yeah, no, like entire... about, that was one of the things I thought was fun to do because, like, throughout most of the book, like even in the first issue, if you read issue one, like, and it's Peril's just a painting in that first issue, like a painting on the wall, but. If you look at it, every panel he moves slightly, um, like he's in a different position, like when you've seen them before. <laughs> it was oh, like a I, I need to thing. go back and read it now. Um, but like you know, and like so we had this idea of like having that in the background and having like Piero be the big reveal at the end, like you know, it's something that's kind of like the other shoe waiting to drop. So that was kind of like a fun little thing to play with. But yeah, like in terms of like you know horror and like you know seeing you know the, like you know like you're thinking you're seeing more like you know like quality horror and stuff i think that it's really that like you say horror doesn't need to be about um you know what's the most disgusting thing or what's like the grossest thing or what's the most you know for me i think horror is ultimately like any other genre i think you can make this argument about any genre where i think the best horror comes from building characters you care about and like stories that feel real and i think that applies to any genre like it's the same thing i think comedy is best when it's like based on like real characters who you care about you know because because yeah. like, if you because if you invest in the character and you and the character feels real then when something funny happens to them it feels funnier because like it's like a real person and it's like you know something's happened to them but if it's a real character who you care about and have invested in um, if something scary happens to them, it, it feels scarier because you care about their well-being. You don't want something bad to happen to them. So um, that's kind of like I feel like is the kind of ingredient, like you know, any genre is like trying to kind of have that seed of something new to kind of launch, you know, up from. And sorry, when you started talking about comedy, I'm like, oh crap! You wrote the uh, going back to this uh, was issue two of the first run. Oh yeah, there's a there's a there's a piece of comedy in here. And especially as it flows, oh, I didn't mean to do that. As it, so, um, I'm trying to think what to be the, the line. It's the couple. He keeps cutting up his girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> he keeps coming back and wants to be with him. Now, there's one line in that which um, I was really pleased about. Well, first, yeah, to give well, this is an example of like the kind of anthology format and the tricks we played. Like for example, in Hotel Issue One, um, the main character in Issue One at one point meets the the the, the man who lives in Room Two, and he's kind of like being a bit of a creep and flirting with her, and then like. 
the, the door to room two opens and his wife's there and he's all shocked. He's like, oh. And then, like, the main character this year one's like, oh, busty. Do you think it's like, oh, he's just in a shop because he's been caught, like, flirting with another woman? And then in volume, then issue two, you find out that he's so shocked because he's just came back from, like, chopping her up and disposing of her body. And now she's back in the room and she's fine. But for me, like, um, when you're talking about funny, one line that I really enjoyed in that issue, I think my favourite line in that whole chapter is, I think this, after the second time, he's chopped her up to bits um, and she comes back, she says, I hope you know that you've ruined our anniversary. <laughs> Which I was like, <laughs> I got one line tonight. Um, but I was actually just having like you know a conversation with um, Dalabar about this, about, another, about one of the volume two issues, where if I can, I do enjoy um, if even in something scary, I think it's nice to have like a little bit of silliness in there at some point, or like you know, or like a little joke to lighten the mood, or to add a bit of because it can't be all grim all the time. And you have oh, to yeah. have a little bit of levity, even if you watch like a movie like I don't know Hereditary, like you know that has funny scenes in it. Like you know, mm-hmm. yeah, you can't, you can't be dark and serious all the time, but. Um, like for me, like that, I think that's something I think is quite nice to have that kind of like release. Like even in Mountainhead, we were talking about Mountainhead earlier on. It's like a scene when like there's like some horrific, like monstrous transformation. Then like a wee beat where a character says like, "What the fuck?" You know, like and it's like you have like you know like little moments like you know where it's fun to kind of like put a little bit of a gag in there. Um, and so yeah, that so that was like it was quite fun to play with that. Um, and obviously that's the fun of Hotel as well, is that because of the anthology format, you can tell different types of stories. So you can tell ones that are more serious and grim and kind of like, you know, like terrifying, like chapter three. Or you can have ones, you know, like number two, which are kind of like an archaic creep show, blackly comic type stories. Yeah. And it's fun to kind of have different kind of like, you know, muscles to flex over the course of the series. Yeah, I think I would say three was probably my uh, most uncomfortable sort of scary one. But oh, yeah. all, the, all of them were good. like, as a whole, I liked it. And that's one of the, like, especially as they fed off of each other. And then issue one of Hotel Volume 2, I love I love that one. I, I, I'm not a horror guy. And then I'm not a wrestling guy either. And then you throw in Shakespeare. Is it really Shakespeare? Is were you, yeah. Or is that just the pitch? Like, I, what, no, how no, did that is, pitch I, go? It's literally an adaptation of my bed. Yeah. So basically the premise of Crimson Cage is it is uh, – Retelling of William Shakespeare's Macbeth set against the backdrop of 1980s pro wrestling territories tells the story of Chuck Frenzy, who is the main event star of a small-time Louisiana promotion. He's a beloved local hero, but a big fish in a small pond, and he's not really content with his lot in life. Then after a fateful encounter with some terrifying entities in the bayou, he learns he's destined to become the next world champion. And when the current world champion shows up in the territory to wrestle a few matches, he he realizes there's a chance to make his destiny come true. He's going to have to do something terrible to make that happen. Now, I don't want to spoil a 400-year-old story if you've not read it yet, but you know, but things only go badly. It's called a tragedy for a reason. But yeah, no, like for so that was my the, the kind of like for me, I always feel like I'm never the best at pitching comics. I always feel like whenever I've had to pitch a comic before, like. It's like you're trying to say, oh, yeah, and this happens, and this happens, and this happens. Or, or, or just, just read the book and you'll get it. But for this, I felt like that one sentence, like, you know, it's Macbeth, 1980s wrestling. Immediately, I think, like, you know, that tells you what this book is and whether folk, like, are going to like it or not. And I was delighted when I came up with this pitch. Like, I, I'm a big fan of wrestling. Um, going back to as a little kid, and I like, go back to my early days in comics, like the standard days. Like I had the idea in my head, like, I'd love to do a comic set in the world of like the nineteen eighties territories, which was actually a little bit before my time. I'm a nineties kid, but um, mm. I was always fascinated by that era of history, like in the early eighties and that kind of time of change, like just before like WWF blew up and swallowed up all these little regional territories. Um, and so I had an idea. I wanted to do a story with that setting, but I didn't know what the story would be. So it kind of got filed away in my head for later. Fast forward a few years, and I was watching uh, Macbeth, the Michael Fassbender version that came out in 2015. And it's a great movie, um, really atmospheric, Rich Helen, and that kind of reawakened my love of Macbeth from school. Like most kids in school hate Shakespeare. I loved Shakespeare in high school. First year of high school was uh, Macbeth, and 
I was already like a wee horror loving weirdo back then, so uh, I, I, I was like, this is a horror story, it's got witches, it's got ghosts, it's got decapitations, it's got murder, it's got curses, you know, it's all the kind of stuff I like, and so yeah, like I fell in love with the idea back then, like, you know, because I started thinking about my Beth again, thanks to this movie, and shortly after that, I saw a movie called Throne of Blood by Akira Kurosawa, mm. um, which is another remake of Macbeth. And I love that movie. It's became one of my all-time favourite films. I've watched it over and over again since then. And I became a bit obsessed with it. And I started thinking, it's so genius how they took Macbeth and transplanted that to the world of like feudal Japan and samurai. If I was doing my version of Macbeth, what would I translate it to? And then that dormant idea of like the wrestling 1980s kind of came back in. I was like, oh my God, like wrestling with Beth, like, you know, go together. Yeah. And it actually fits together really well. Which really, the more I started thinking about it, I was like, it's one of those things where like, I really have this. Usually ideas for me are like a long process of like defining, but this idea just came together like doom, 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 doom. Like, and I was thinking, oh my god! Like instead of like you know the king is the champion, um, and then like you know and, you know you have like instead of like you know the king coming to state his castle, he's like a wrestler coming to visit his territory, you know, and like and, and everything all kind of clicked together. Even things like um, in Shakespeare. And the tragedies, the main characters, you know, will step out aside and give soliloquies where they directly talk to the audience. And in this, our version of that is um, wrestlers cutting promos where they have a microphone and they're talking to the camera, but they're talking, they're talking like to the reader. So we do that in the book instead. And so just all the little bits of like iconography and all the little flourishes all clicked right in the place. And it was one of those things where I was like, man, I could feel my heart beating. So I was thinking, about, oh my God, this is like a great idea. I hope nobody's done it already. Sure, they have, yeah. but thankfully they hadn't. And yeah, like, and it became an idea. I just felt like I first developed this idea back in 2017 and I fell in love with it. And it became one of these things where, for me as a writer, one of the most powerful motivators for doing any story is if there's a story that you as a reader love and want it to exist, but it doesn't exist, so you have to make it. And that's the only way it's going to exist. That's how I felt about The Crimson Cage, where, like, you know, I wasn't going to be content till this book was out in the world. And it's taken a while, like, it's been a few years, but we finally got there and it's finally out there. And I'm so proud of it. Like, because it's a dream project that I've wanted to do for a long time. I think it's been my best thing that I've written. I'm really proud of how it turned out. And, like, it looks great. Alex Cormack's on R, Ashley Cormack's in colours. It's Anna, it's me, Nailhouse, the letter. It's like a great team. So, I'm just really glad I got to tell this story at the level that I wanted to tell it. That's awesome. So, so you got to go back to your sink boy and okay, go, hey, come come with me. We're going to do AWA. We're going to do the story I've been wanting to tell for five years. Yeah, pretty and... much. Well, um, Alex, like, I, I talk to Alex every day, pretty much. Um, yeah. But um, but the time we just finished volume one of Sync, volume two was coming up. And I think it was, um, it would have been late 2017, actually. It probably would have been when I was at New York Comic Con in 2017. We were sitting having dinner at Bon Chon Chicken uh, in Manhattan. And like, and I was telling like uh, Alex about this idea I developed. I was thinking, but I don't know who's going to draw it yet. And he's like, you know, I'll draw it. I'm like, are you sure? As well as drawing sync, and he's like, yeah, I'll do that too. It's fine. So yeah, it ended up being like, you know, that I worked on it with Alex, and yeah, I couldn't have it any other way because he's brought so much to the story. And like, because I've worked so much with Alex, like he's one of my best friends. Like he's super talented. Um, has a great style. It's got to the point now where whenever I come up with any new comic idea, my mind automatically imagines it as drawn by Alex Cormack, and I have to, like, think, like, if I'm going to get someone else to do it, I have to kind of consciously, like, unthink of Alex and think of somebody else. Like, yeah. he's, like, the default in my head now. Um, and our sensibilities are so well aligned um, that uh, I think it's just a perfect match. And, like, you know, I'd, I'd love to be working with him in some capacity forever, if you'll have me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, like, and there's a lot of great pairs. Of, like, when I think of through, like, a lot of, writers and artists they go together or they you can tell they they write stuff for certain artists like uh the one i that actually got me back into com comics was a uh, bendis and malib alex malib yeah like they've done several different types of books well sort of but like spider woman M moon knight uh then they went to D dc together and did some things uh like I have a sensibility it's like more than the sum more than the sum of the parts like when they come yeah. together 
But like, and yeah, that one of the great things about being a writer is that I get to have that with multiple different artists. Like, you know, mm. for me, like I look at my partnership with Alex Cormack, and like, you know, that brings out one quality of my work. And then I look at like the partnership between me and Ian, Ian Laurie, who did and then when he was gone, that brings out a different quality. And I mean, I've given this analogy before that like me and Alex are like totally in lockstep, where we often come up with the same ideas like separately and bring them together. Like, you know, mm. and like, you know, we're really kind of like you know harmonious and like you know, we're on the same page. Um. Whenever I, whenever I work with Ian, Ian is an artist who is like super abstract and strange and out there and like really kind of like, you know, doing like really experimental, like, you know, arty stuff. I'm very mainstream in my sensibilities. I'm very much about what's the plot, what's the character arcs, what's the structure. Um, so, and then what was gone was simultaneously my most strange, out there, loose arty book I've ever done and Ian's most mainstream like work ever. So I kind of yeah. feel that whenever me and Ian work together, there's this kind of tension where we're both pulling in opposite directions mm-hmm. and we're both kind of getting different creative impulses. But in that tension and then it's both kind of wrestling each other, we kind of like both of us are driven to kind of do interesting creative decisions we otherwise wouldn't do. Um which I think makes like a really interesting dynamic for working together. Very cool. Before we sign off and all that, I want to talk about You've mentioned it a couple of times, but right now on Kickstarter is Dig. Yes, and that, Dig. that's what it. Talk about what Dig is. It, I know it, it's a follow up or a one shot to sync. Yeah, well, the premise was going to be that obviously, like, um, the great thing as I touched on before, like, sync. The great thing about sync is that it's like you know all one shots. So you can pick up any issue and you can get a standalone story for the most part. But even with that said, like, you know, as we go into volume three, it's like sync 11, sync 12, sync 13. Folk might be put off by by picking up like a book with double digits in this title. So we had the idea of, to make that a little less daunting, um, we'll have a little bridge the gap where like, you know, sync volume, I would always plan to have a a hiatus after sync volume two. And then the plan was going to be, we're going to come back and we're going to do dig which is like an OGN, a kind of like standalone graphic novel, um, or graphic novella, more like it's like 60 odd pages. Um, and then from there we'd launch into like Sync Volume 3, like, you know, you know, so like that's so the purpose of this book is one, it is a kind of catch up for established readers to kind of remind them of the world of Sync, kind of reintroduce the key players and set the table for some of the arcs that are going to be kind of like unfolding in the coming issues. And then, um, for people who've never read Sync before, this is kind of like a jumping on point. It's like, here's Sync, here's Sync Hill, here's one of our most interesting characters, Mr. Digger, kind of iconic figure, and here's his backstory. And the good thing is that because it's not part of the main Sync universe, uh, or not main Sync universe, main Sync series, but it is, in the, it is in the same Sync universe, but because it's not part of that main series, we get to do things we wouldn't get to do in the main book like for example the main book is almost entirely set in glasgow and this one we can travel all over the world the main series is always almost always set in the present in this book we can kind of jump back and forth in time and do flashbacks and show different Mm -hmm. stuff and because we have more space we can have this massive fight sequence over like 20 pages (laughs) that takes place in the book um and so yeah so the basic premise of dig is it's telling the backstory of mr dig how his origins how he came to be how he came to glasgow how he ended up um with this you know motivation to you know like beat up the criminals and the you know, the corrupt in the world with a big shovel and at the same time as like setting up this origin we also introduce you know, mr dig's deadliest enemy yet i kind of really menacing new antagonist who is set to kind of burn everything he's tried to build to the ground and mm-hmm. it's yeah it's a really fun book and i think anyone who's enjoyed sync will really like love this but even if you've only heard of sync and you're curious about it it's a great point to kind of get in the van and jump on board okay that's awesome and John, I, I, in terms of like the hiatus as well sorry to, just to say like um i know like the original plan had been that we were going to like we did, when volume two came out in 2019 we we're originally going to like take a break we we're going to do the crimson cage in 2020 then come back with dig in volume three in 2021 however then a global pandemic happened and pushed the whole timeline back a year oh, yeah. so we ended up crimson cage didn't happen until this year and now like it's next year it's going to be volume three's coming out very okay uh john thank you so much for taking this moment to sit and talk to us to talk to cbsi and let us sort of know what's going on because 
not only did I mention your book this week talking about, cause it just came out this week. The, the we have a guy who does indie spotlight and he was so stoked about the crimson cage. He's a giant wrestling fan. So he was excited. And then we have another article that we do called the Wednesday one. And it was one of the books mentioned like the number of like, I'm the anomaly in my group who doesn't like wrestling. The, these guys get so excited. So they were so excited about your book coming out about wrestling and Macbeth and, and all these different things. I, I really enjoyed reading your book. It just wrestling is not the first thing. That, oh, I'm going to get but that. The thing is, I'm actually happy, like, it's particularly happy that you liked it, though, because, like, for me, like, one of the things I've seen one of the great challenges of the book is what I wanted to do is I wanted to create something that if you're a wrestling fan like me, you'll get so much out of it in terms of all the references to wrestling. You'll see all the parallels. You'll get a lot out of it. But also, if you're not a wrestling fan, I want this to serve as like an introduction to that world. And also, even if you don't care about wrestling at all, it's still Macbeth. You still have like this universal story of like betrayal and ambition and greed and violence and that appeals to anybody, I think. So um hopefully like I'm glad that you still got something out of it, even if it's not the kind of thing you you know typically enjoy. That makes me particularly happy. Oh good. Well, like I said, thank you so much. Uh this is gonna go live as soon as I so we stop recording. And then I'm going to make the article go live and I'll send it yeah, to you so you can share it with that's on fantastic. your social media. Thank you very much. Like I say, I'm happy to um, spread the love. And again, like, you know, Hotel Volume 1 out last week, Crimson Cage, um, Issue 1 out today or this week. And yeah, like, go to Dig on Kickstarter and watch for more stuff in the year ahead. Thanks again. Thank you, guys. And links will be in the article for the Kickstarter so you can do it. And go to your LCS. Your local comic shops are great. AWA is one that they have been pushing when I walk into any store that they will tell people to pick up an AWA book. Is, yeah, they're, you guys, they're, they're doing really exciting stuff. It's, cool to be a part it's of good it. writing. It's good reading. Yeah. So, thank you.